To begin the morning session of showing the big interconnected picture of groundwater and climate change in California, we have Dr. Ruth Langridge from the University of, Sa University of California, Santa Cruz. Do Dr. Langridge is the principal investigator for the NOAA-funded Groundwater Drought Reserves Project, and she'll be outlining the groundwater and surface water resources for the state, as well as highlighting locations that are most vulnerable as we move forward with climate change. Good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this very interesting uh, symposium. So today I'm going to talk very briefly about California's water resources. I was asked to place everybody on the same page, uh, although I'm sure you're all already quite familiar with them. Then I'm going to talk about the history of groundwater use and management uh, in the state and current challenges. And then I'll say some more words about our groundwater drought reserves project. Geography is really significant in our state. Um, we can see that we have an ample river system that feeds off of the Sierras as well as the Klamath uh, Mountains up in the north. Uh, we have a series of rivers as well that are along the coast. And we have about 551 dedicated groundwater basins. And as Ken mentioned, about 30% of our uh, water comes from groundwater. That increases, I have 40% and he uh, said 60%, so clearly uh, it's increasing. Climate is also really important in California and it's really shaped the way we think about developing our resource in this state. And so I'll mention three aspects of climate here and then I'll talk about a, third, a fourth one a little bit further along in my uh, talk. Uh, the first thing to note is that it's seasonal. Uh, precipitation is seasonal, it's wet in winter, dry in summer, and of course this is really problematic because agriculture needs water in the summer. Uh, we all need drinking water all year round. Uh, we also have more rain in the north than we do in the south, and yet we have uh, tremendous agricultural development and urban development in the south. And then finally we get heavy spring uh, uh, runoff from snowmelt in the Sierras, uh, and that has shaped the way we've thought about developing our water resources in the state. Well, early California was very reliant on groundwater as its uh, water resource, uh, along with some surface water as well, and this became even more potent uh, as uh, settlers arrived with the gold rush and needed food, and that began the development of uh, agriculture in California. And again, in the Central Valley, very reliant uh, on groundwater, as well as along areas of the coast. Uh, this uh, groundwater withdrawals became even uh, more potent with the arrival of the centrifugal pump, and we began to see some significant development, uh, both in urban areas and in agriculture. Uh, and the Central Valley really boomed uh, in terms of production, uh, agricultural production. But there was also a downside to this, and that was that as pumping increased substantially, uh, we began to have subsidence, and that's the famous picture near Mendota where you can see uh, the degree of subsidence that occurred. Uh, and uh, one of the things that happened during this period was that there were uh, calls to build uh, large surface storage and transmission systems to alleviate the groundwater pumping and the subsidence in the Central Valley. And indeed, we did that. Uh, we, uh, the federal government built the Central Valley Project that was originally, of course, a state uh, desire, but it was turned over to the federal government during the Depression, and that provided uh, extensive water to agricultural areas in the Central Valley. Uh, there were still calls for yet more water supplies, and we built the state water project that provided water further south to uh, urban areas uh, along uh, the south coast and to some extent inland, as well as to uh, agriculture further south in the Central Valley, such as Kern County, uh, which is one of the biggest recipients of the state water project uh, water. 
and uh, the Central Valley continued uh, to uh, grow in agricultural production, and we actually did see some uh, recovery of groundwater levels in the Central Valley, but pumping continued uh, to occur. Uh, and I'm going to pause for a moment on the Central Valley now and look at coastal California, which is often not discussed in many of uh, our discussions about water in California, uh, certainly at the state level. Uh, and to do this, I'm going to look at two uh, aspects of uh, coastal groundwater development. The first is going to be urban, and the second will be agricultural. So for urban, I'm going to uh, sort of take you through, uh, all of this is, is of course very brief and tight to keep to my 20 minutes, but uh, take you through development, uh, uh, groundwater development in the LA area, and that also began very early on uh, to build, uh, as you can see by 1930, a considerable metropolis and uh, uh, the problem was that as the metropolis grew and the pumping continued, we had the second really big impact that you see with groundwater withdrawals in California, and that's saltwater intrusion. It began as early as 1900, uh, and you're going to see that many of the problems we confront today have been around for a very long time, and I think that's really important uh, because we're always trying to reinvent the wheel to some extent, but we've been thinking about these issues uh, a lot over, uh, over a century, really. I'll mention the Central and West Basin. They're a particularly interesting area. Uh, they uh, had significant groundwater withdrawals, and they began to have saltwater intrusion, and that encompasses Los Angeles and a number of other uh, cities in that area. And then uh, they finally, the basin was adjudicated. And I'd like to say a really quick word about that adjudication, which is interesting. It, uh, it was adjudicated, uh, and groundwater uh, rights were uh, given to overlying owners uh, in relation to historical pumping. Not so great, race to the pump before the adjudication. And that was uh, changed uh, somewhat later in the later adjudications. The other really interesting thing about this adjudication is that, well, there were two more interesting things. It was based on a safe yield that it turned out in subsequent years uh, was reevaluated to be significantly uh, uh, lower than uh, was originally settled on, and uh, water rights were uh, granted to all the overlying pumpers, and those remain fixed. Uh, after, around the time that the adjudication occurred, the West Coast Replenishment District was formed, and here's another very interesting thing. They were not, um, the pumpers were not asked to curtail water use, uh, water pumping, but rather the replenishment district was formed to find alternative sources of water uh, to try to alleviate the saltwater intrusion, which they have to some extent fairly successfully. Uh, and finally, one other uh, aspect that maybe will be touched on uh, by the uh, speaker uh, on the legal issues is that you can see there is a really big uh, hole in that basin, and uh, they have been in litigation to uh, determine who actually owns that storage space, and that's true for storage spaces uh, around our state where we've pumped a lot of water. Uh, and the latest uh, determination was that it actually is a public space uh, and that use rights can be granted to store water. So I thought that was quite interesting, so I spent a little more time than I meant to on that. Uh, we also had uh, so we had development of agriculture along the coast, and we see that in the Pajaro Valley as early as 1890s, you saw uh, apple orchards being planted. These were supplanted by berries. I guess look at this. Uh, these were uh, supplanted by berries, uh, and uh, you had a similar. Uh, problem in Pajaro where you began to see some significant saltwater intrusion uh, and uh, this has not really been halted today. It's been slowed down and I'll talk about Pajaro a little bit further along uh, in the talk. So the fourth area of California's climate that I'd like to mention now is that we have periodic droughts. And we all know that groundwater pumping uh, increases substantially to compensate for reduced surface supplies. Uh, there was an interesting study that looked at this in the 1980, actually 7 to 92 drought, where as surface water supplies in the reservoirs decreased, uh, the wells uh, uh, 
that were, dr uh, were uh, drilled increased. Uh, we also saw during this era uh, some other changes that uh, affected groundwater. There were changes uh, in farming, so uh, we now know that that many permanent crops have been planted uh, that are high value. Of course, those cannot be fallowed during a drought. Uh, uh, we've had population growth, uh, and we've had declining surface water allocations uh, due to a variety of new, in well, I wouldn't say new interests, but uh, diverse interests that have come in to uh, claim water. So we can see that drought and groundwater are really linked, and here we are today. 2014, and we're yet in another drought. Uh, the little uh, bar graphs are the average in the, uh, uh, sorry, the little lines are the average in the bar graph show where our precipitation is today. So what is our response to drought? As I've mentioned, we usually pump more groundwater, and you can see again in 2013, just the way we had it during the earlier drought, you have an increase in well permits, and that is continuing uh, into 2014. The problem is that studies are beginning to show clearly that the volume pump during droughts from groundwater basins generally exceeds the replenishment during rains. That's why we continue to see our groundwater levels trending down in many instances uh, and why it's been uh, difficult for uh, some of the coastal areas like Pajaro uh, to improve uh, their uh, groundwater uh, recoveries. And uh, they, they uh, actually demonstrated uh, that the water levels fell significantly and did not fully recover during that 87-92 drought. Uh, we have additional responses to drought as well. We have water curtailment after a drought occurs, and that's actually the typical response to drought that we have in our state. Uh, but we also hear calls to generate uh, more supply. We do this whether it's surface storage, and we see those calls today uh, through conservation, desalination, recycled water. But one really important cautionary uh, lesson is that when we increase water, during dry years or when we develop our strategies and our plans to increase water, those are often followed by wet years. Without developing any kind of reserve supply uh, and using that additional water that we now have in the wet years for further development, uh, along with the hardening of demand side, uh, supply strat uh, demand side um, reduction strategies, we find that we're uh, more vulnerable in the next drought. And we see that over and over again. Uh, we see that uh, in declining levels uh, in groundwater overdraft, 1980, 1990, and 2013, DWR uh, made the statement that many of these basins still are showing signs of continued depletion. So that's what led us in part to our uh, groundwater reserves project. Uh, it's a very interdisciplinary project, so it fits very well with the theme of this. We've had a hydrogeologist, Andy Fisher, who's here today, was uh, the very first person who uh, came in on this project. And our focus was a lot on the hydrogeology of the particular case studies that we looked at. Uh, we also have a, a modeler today. We have a sociologist, we have an economist, we have someone from the Center for Collaborative Policy, and we have a team of graduate students, again, from various departments at UC Santa Cruz. We came up with the idea of trying to develop local groundwater drought reserves. Uh, originally, I thought of it as just a general strategic reserve, like the the strategic oil reserve that we have, but really moved over to looking at it in a very specific way, serving as a buffer during an extreme uh, drought. Clearly, it would reduce overdraft impacts because you'd have to develop, uh, you'd have to improve your groundwater management. It's less energy intensive. It supports groundwater ecosystems, uh, dependent ecosystems, and we uh, feel that John Steinbeck said it very well. In fact, I would add that the time to think about drought is when it's raining. Uh, how does our approach differ from uh, current groundwater banking? Uh, we're focusing on sources that are uh, reserves that are sourced, cited, and used locally with a really important goal of recovering groundwater levels to avert, avoid further declines during a drought, uh, which is not generally uh, the main goal of our current groundwater banking. Uh, we've looked at a variety of case studies. We've looked at uh, motivations for uh, 
for regions to improve their drought resilience and groundwater management. We're looking at pumping and energy use. We're looking at uh, areas like Pajaro that have had a lot of difficulty uh, recovering their groundwater basins or improving their, their management. And we're looking at the economic costs and benefits. Uh, I'm gonna have to go fast now. Uh, we looked at the physical context, the legal institutional context, the socio-political context of our case studies. I wanted to say one quick thing about the legal system, which I know we will be talking about, but you do not uh, need to have a permit for uh, withdrawing groundwater in the state. And uh, landowners overlying a basin can pump as much water as they want, so long as it's reasonable with respect to other landowners, uh, as well as certain constraints that are placed on them uh, through state doctrines. Uh, what that really means is you have Entity A over here that wants to uh, improve the groundwater management, recover levels, and Entity B on the same basin that doesn't, and you're going to have a very difficult time uh, trying to improve management. It also means that local agencies are the main place where this happens. Uh, we looked at what motivates management to reduce overdraft. We looked at case studies on the Central Coast and the North Coast. Uh, I've mentioned Pajaro. Uh, they are trying very hard with recycled water, which is uh, a very, what we're seeing all around the state is this uh, move towards recycled water, a little different uh, than the Central and West Basin, where they are providing through a coastal distribution center to growers along the coast. But I want you to note the geography of Pajaro and uh, the fact that the pumpers on the coast see the saltwater intrusion and the pumpers inland do not uh, makes for a very contentious uh, situation and we are now doing a more in-depth case study with our sociology students to try to understand better what kinds of common ground can be found to have people, as somebody said to me, thinking like a basin. <laughs> um, I think I'll have to skip over some of this since I'm running out of time, uh, but uh, I'll mention that Scotts Valley Water District uh, did the same, uh, saw the same thing that happened in our um, West Coast uh, Central Coast Basins, uh, they managed to stabilize their water uh, through very uh, major conservation uh, practices. Uh, but we're concerned that during the next severe drought, in fact, we're looking into data to see, well, what's happening now? Is Long term, is this going to work? Uh, I did want to say something about sustainable yield, and then that's almost done at this point, uh, because I know that that is often safe sustainable yield is the way we think sometimes about how to determine how much we can safely withdraw from a basin. Well, what we have seen is that it often depends on an impact. In other words, you want to make sure you don't get saltwater intrusion and you don't get subsidence, and that's often the driver. Uh, we also uh, have noted that levels continue to decline in many areas throughout the state, and so to develop some kind of reserve system, we think that, that the idea of that has to be uh, built into calculating safe yield, which uh, is, in some in instances, it is a little bit. For example, the Central West Coast, ba West Coast Basin uses a 30-year average, uh, but in many instances, uh, we do not do that, and we think that would be important. Uh, it was done for uh, Soquel Creek by one of our graduate students who was on the board of Soquel Creek, and you can see the red line is their current levels. The blue line is where they want to be stop salt water intrusion and the green line is where you would have to be to prevent your levels declining and allowing salt water intrusion during a drought. Local agencies have done a lot. We were really impressed with the efforts they're making. What more needs to be done? Well, there are several recommendations I can make, but here are two that I think are really important. Uh, to receive state funding, which we get quite a lot of, uh, we think it's really important that you mandate, that you really require uh, specific overdraft reduction goals and strategies, as well as, at the very least, a consideration of how you would develop reserves uh, as part of receiving uh, those funds. And then the elephant in the room, you can see that so much has been focused on supply, and as I mentioned in the Central and West Coast Basin, there was nothing about uh, thinking about curtailing withdrawals sort of the way we do uh, in urban areas with saying, okay, let's cut, cut back on our uh, water withdrawals. And we, uh, in response to Ken Alex, we think that uh, we should be exploring some kind of state-local partnership uh, that can set some kind of standards for uh, local agencies. Now, many will be already achieving those standards, but it will help those that are not. Ran over just a little bit. 
thank you.